Okay, welcome everybody to uh, an out of cycle uh, talk today, but one I think is going to be uh, pretty interesting. Hopefully, generates a lot of discussion and questions. We have Marit Bromer with us today, who is the executive director of the International Geothermal Association. Oh, do I need to talk? Yeah, to start over. Okay. No, you're good. You're good. It's not so clear. Okay, uh, we have Merit Bromer, executive director of the International Geothermal Association, with us today. Uh, she started that position in 2017, coming from the oil and gas sector, uh, primarily Shell, I believe, where uh, it turns out she knows a fair number of people here at the Bureau. Uh, so with a decade of experience in technology uh, deployment, geoscience portfolio management, Merritt is a passionate geologist with a master's from the Free University in Amsterdam and a PhD from Technical University Delft. She's dedicated to transition the IGA, the International Geothermal Association, into a professional body renowned for geothermal expertise, networking opportunities, and global presence. In addition, she's keen to strengthen the activities with clean energy partners with a commitment to low carbon energy mix. Now that I've read the, the formal uh, bio, uh, a few things. We met a couple of, uh, actually several years ago, and I had originally intended to try to get Merritt here uh, for a talk and then the pandemic hit. And so uh, another example of how that affects us and delays us by a few years, but uh, she's graciously agreed to be on a panel for Energy Week tomorrow uh, and talk to us today. She also, I will note, as I just found out, Merit means pearl of the sea, which <laughs> I, I think should be your byline on LinkedIn or something. I think that's, people will remember that for sure. But Merit sits in perhaps the single best position in the world for watching, assessing, and communicating the growth of geothermal. She travels all over the world. You're coming to us right now from Mexico, I think, yesterday. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over uh, to Merit for her talk. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, very good morning. And uh, gee, Ken, was it indeed uh, three years ago when you invited me for the first time to come over and then the pandemic hit indeed. Um, but here I am. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me here uh, on, your, on your campus uh, today for giving an overview of where we stand within uh, geothermal and doing a bit of an uh, overview of our global stock take, not only where we are at now, but also how we see development. And I'm very keen to get your feedback, your observations, and of course, especially coming, I assume more from a technology background, very keen to discuss synergies all over the world where we can add on and accelerate geothermal development because that we have something to do. I am convinced of that. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. So I don't need to go over myself and my background, but what I do like to give you a bit of a flavor of and a bit of an overview on is where IGA is working, where we stand, where we have landed, and also where we are active on the ground. We are at the moment active in 75 countries all over the world, uh, and we're basically on all continents, we're having an activity. Whether that is because we are working with partners, uh, whether we are working with national associations who have developed their own geothermal portfolio roadmap and hence has formed, for instance, a geothermal association under the domestic and national legislation. We're working with partners like uh, International Renewable Energy Agency is for us a very strong partner. They're based in Abu Dhabi and they're overseeing the renewable energy sphere and space uh, across the world. They have formed the Geothermal Alliance as well, the Global Geothermal Alliance, specifically set to convene the political leadership of this uh, world in order to advance the agenda on geothermal. And we are their industry partner in order to implement. Besides all these partners, we have a financial community behind us, uh, basically the public uh, finance coming from the World Bank, who is one of our strongest partners in the finance uh, world. Uh, in combination with the other development banks, such as the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and last but not least, we're working on, uh, let's say, on the ground to facilitate financing for projects, uh, predominantly in the global south. Our main goal and one of the strongest partners that we have in terms of advocacy and lobbying is the UN, the United Nations. They are very strong uh, also for us in terms of being an ambassador. 
The 17 goals of the United Nations, the SDGs, uh, are important to all of us human beings on this planet, um, but also for all the beautiful, uh, let's say, uh, environments that we want to preserve and be good to in terms of biodiversity, environmental awareness. That is all part of the 17 SDGs, which has a target to be achieved by 2030. Now, for us working in energy, uh, number seven is, uh, is our mission. And hence, we would like to see ourselves as a global geothermal community contributing to first and foremost, number seven, the SDG seven, which is clean and affordable energy for all. That that is uh, not an easy task is, of course, quite uh, quite known, I guess, for all of us uh, who have worked either within the oil and gas industry or the mining industry. Uh, the entire extractive industry in combination with also coal, 80% uh, of our uh, energy mix is still based on fossil fuels. And that percentage hasn't changed over the past three decades. So what we're adding uh, on to the grid is merely a percentage and we're not really substantially phasing out at this moment our fossil fuel consumption. So SDG 7 to be achieved is not only let's say, uh, a nice to have, I think it's a must have in combination with working together and bridging with our oil and gas friends. Within the IGA, we have set our target to a few things and a few, let's say, elements of that I would like to highlight here today under this, uh, under this talk and also try to seek the synergies with groups like yourself in order to achieve more together. Our target is, and our work program aligns with a couple of high level, let's say dialogues we need to set on a yearly basis. We are the global industry association and hence our target is high level politicians, high level governments and seeking the dialogue between business industry and those high level political, uh, let's say ministries of energy, uh, state of secretaries, et cetera, et cetera. And hence for us, it's very important that we keep on talking about geothermal as a sustainable source of energy, whether we're targeting electricity or whether we're targeting heating and cooling, whether we're targeting the automobile industry via lithium supplies, which is also a hot topic, no pun intended. Um, all these things are crucial in order to have these meaningful, effective uh, conversations. So sustainability is key. We're targeting cities and industries because later on I talk as well, and I think you, you know much more about geothermal ins and outs than I will ever do, but the heat beneath our feet uh, can source many solutions in the sense that we don't need to just produce electricity with 250 degrees Celsius. I'm talking in Celsius, that's my sort of, uh, 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 let's say, metric system I would like to adhere to. We also use, for instance, uh, heat pumps, which can be like, say, between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. But the predominant cities that need some heating and cooling may only need between 60 and 100 degrees Celsius. And if there's something that we find everywhere on this planet is exactly that. So cities and industries with a light temperature need are the ones that we target. In combination with, we run one flagship event every three years, it's our World Geothermal Congress. This year it is in Beijing, it is scheduled for later in the year, and we're working with some, uh, some hosts. For instance, the city of Beijing is our main host in combination with Sinopec, which is the state uh, Chinese uh, oil company, uh, in a joint venture with Arctic Green Energy. So they are in principle our host. The target and hence the themes for WGC will be very much on clean heat clean heat to, let's say, clean up the air for citizens of the world to breathe. They have launched a fantastic program over the past decade to shy away from coal for their, let's say, um, a heating and cooling system in their cities. And as we know, their cities are huge, especially for me coming from the Netherlands originally, where we only have 17 million people, that's considered a small town in China meaning that geothermal has sourced uh, already uh, hundreds of, uh, of gigawatts uh, thermal uh, in China, which is a phenomenal task in the past decade. Um, I was asked to say something on global geothermal and especially the views and the perspectives that I, on behalf of IGA have. Um, and I do appreciate that maybe for the hardcore technologists and the hardcore geoscientists, this may be a bit of a, uh, uh, let's say, elusive uh, overview, but the reason why I do this is because I would like to lift our conversations to that higher level. That's the job that I have at IGA. It's my job to combine and connect and integrate and hear each other's perspectives where we are on this planet and try to make a meaningful conversation with those, the ones who can act and decide, but also the ones who know and want to deliver. 
So before I go into this, uh, let's say, stock take, uh, I would like to um, express my uh, sincere gratitude for the ones who are working in data and data analyses, and hence the ones who have put together hard work in terms of mapping our resources. And I know there are loads of exciting initiatives uh, on the way to do this better and faster and more public available, because I think we can we can still do a world of knowledge sharing, both from a, uh, let's say, a science to public, but also from a business to uh, solutions oriented, so basically business to business opportunity to make data freely available across the globe. Because as we all know, data is king and information is key, uh, but a lot of data of our subsurface remains either confidential or locked in. Uh, or is not QA and QC uh, tremendously, especially on a global scale. But at the moment, state of the art is, uh, is maps such as this produced uh, by Nature Geoscience, uh, reviews uh, by authors uh, Egbert uh, Jolie uh, and others. And, and, and this is basically the map that has served the purpose of developing geothermal coming from, let's say, the traditional standpoint. So the traditional standpoint is, of course, developing geothermal along the ring of fire and where there are manifestations such as hot springs and other type of manifestations on our beautiful planet. People have used that for traditional bathing, for spas and for direct utilization of those manifestations. And these data are important because I think we can do better, we can do more. And of course, we have a lot to learn from other industries, such as the oil and gas industry, both from, uh, let's say, technology point of view, but also from a delivery point of view. And that is a topic I very keenly would like to speak more about. In summary, our stock take at the moment, 16 gigawatt electric. That is what we have installed in over 380 power plants. We have 380 power plants all over the world and they deliver in combination by the end of 22, 16 gigawatt electric. The average wind farm these days is being, uh, let's say uh, targeted and being developed is delivering between 10 and 12 gigawatt. Okay. Our entire geothermal stock take in terms of gigawatt electric is about one offshore wind farm. We got to do better, okay? We got to do better. We have all that energy, all that energy beneath us. And what we have done is 16 gigawatt electric. And it took a long time because we're here for over a century delivering on this uh, geothermal energy. We're doing slightly better when it comes down to heat. So the direct utilization of geothermal for direct, let's say usage, as we call it, the applications. We have around 110 gigawatt thermal installed and we have many applications. They range from very small to very large greenhouses. They range from spas and I'll come to that in a sec, but we have over 30,000 registered, let's say geothermal applications in over hundred countries. This is a beautiful picture, I think, from the Geovision a couple of years ago, and it clearly demonstrates why we are so good at what we do in terms of understanding how we can use and utilize that heat, because it serves two purposes. Power, electricity at one end, very traditionally are, of course, the very high temperature resources that have been developed in New Zealand and in Iceland and in uh, Kenya and in El Salvador and in Mexico, where they're really using, let's say, that high temperature to produce electricity on the left bottom, uh, on the left uh, top uh, sides. More and more, the emphasis goes to lower temperature and generating electricity with the binaries and the overseas and small and modular and scalability becomes a very important point. And hence this opens up the, the conversation between traditional high enthalpy, high temperature countries and hence projects to more lower temperature or mid enthalpy, mid to low enthalpy projects that can deliver geothermal electricity anywhere. On the right hand side is the direct utilization of geothermal energy. And this is where you can see where this is a wide variety of not only solutions and applications, but also in terms of the temperature range between just a few degrees Celsius to all the way up to producing hydrogen uh, with, uh, with geothermal in the, in the scale of uh, these steam uh, power plants. There are two fantastic examples these days. One is in New Zealand and the other one is in Iceland where they have built in pilot electrolyzers in their geothermal power plant to produce green hydrogen. I'll come to that later on as well. I would like to give you a flavor of direct use of geothermal. This may not be your key topic here at the Bureau, but I would like to demonstrate, but also open up the conversation 
what people are doing with geothermal worldwide at this uh, stage. So in terms of direct use of geothermal, one of my favorites is, of course, bathing and is, of course, all our spas and the onsens in Japan and the spas and the beautiful well, let's say, wellness and the treatments that we do, not only because the water is nice and warm, but also the minerals that are in it is good for the skin, it's good for your body, it's good for your mind. And hence, geothermal has a purpose for many people, whether you are an indigenous let's say community, or whether you are uh, just waiting to be relaxed, uh, relaxations, geothermal has a job to do and it's growing like crazy. So geothermal direct use for spas and wellness is a supermarket, uh, as in it's a big market. Billions of uh, revenue streams are going through this, uh, are going through the market called the spas and the wellness institute. So it is the one that we should not underestimate. Energy security, Combined with food security is the nexus that we all see happening. 90% um, of our food production is based on fossil fuels. Again, whether that is through mandates such as the European Union who want to cut on fossil fuels and hence will, will let's say, um, put some CO2 taxes on their food production, whether it's becoming too expensive to produce tomatoes and peppers and what have you in these greenhouses, one way or the other, Greenhouses is a key target for us as geothermal to, um, to, to, let's say, deliver clean energy for. There are fantastic demonstrations worldwide, both in the Netherlands, in Iceland, in Turkey, in Mexico, where they have geothermal greenhouses. It's cheap, it's affordable, sustainable, and it is um, uh, for, you're in it for the long run, run. And secondly, even in climatic conditions, such as in Iceland and the Arctic North, where food is always imported, imported as in you do not produce your own food locally a greenhouse with a geothermal well is part of the solutions that even the arctic circle these days are talking about how to produce local food and what better way in these dark months to just utilize the heat beneath our feet so for us this is a key element of what we like to preach for and 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 also advocate for coffee i think we all drink coffee there are fantastic examples these days where coffee beans are being roasted and and being dried uh, within, let's say, within geothermal power plants, the cascaded use of utilizing the steam for electricity and then using the heat for running dehydrators, both for fruit drying, but also for coffee beans, is just phenomenal. And hence, it serves as well a sustainable market that people are very interested in these days. We talked about cities. There are a couple of leading cities who are really using geothermal to clean up their air, but also providing a baseload energy source to the citizens in order to have an economic value that supports both the public service that we have as a utility company, for instance, providing heating and cooling solutions to residentials, but also to industry, but predominantly in cities is, of course, residentials. Munich is a leading city that has adopted geothermal already 15 years ago and said we, we are going to be 60% uh, based on geothermal in terms of our heating. We do not want to have oil anymore by the end of 2030. And they have even superseded their uh, objective as in not only accelerated the, the growth path for geothermal development for district heating, uh, they are now sourcing almost 85% of their district heating uh, by geothermal. They have launched the absorption chillers because climate is getting hotter. So the city of Munich also needs some cooling these days. And hence they have adopted the cooling network as well. And they recently launched a 1 billion investment fund in order to accelerate geothermal in the entire Southern Germany region. This is it. This is going to happen. We are on the onset of growth, but that it comes naturally is not the case. You really need still people who vouch for it, who advocate for it, who overcome difficulties such as being prepared to work remote, to being prepared to work with sustainability standards, uh, environmental, biodiversity. The African countries, of course, have a duty not only to provide clean energy, but also have a wildlife that they want to support from, a, from an environmental point of view. So we're interlinking here with geothermal uh, a sustainability journey that I think um, uh, is exciting, but also requires us to closely cooperate with many partners, many partners. We work offshore, offshore, we work in beautiful islands in many shores and shorelines are of course for us very important. They act as imports uh, for, uh, for energy hubs. Uh, most islands on this planet are sourced by diesel. They generate uh, electricity, of course, it provides security and energy access and sustainability is maybe not of your uh, vital point right now. 
because critical infrastructure is more prevalent than sustainability. But I ask always the question, if all these islands would go geothermal, wouldn't it be better? And I think the answer here, I can uh, already see some uh, people who are saying yes to that, but almost all islands in the world are either volcanic or are part of, let's say, a tectonic a setting that is a natural source for heat. And I find it these days an interesting, let's say, dialogue to have, not only with government uh, officials looking after the islands, but also with our science community uh, to, to vouch for very actively to shy away from the diesel imports and the diesel generators and just produce small modular geothermal power plants that are scalable. You don't need to go, for instance, uh, to a 500 megawatt power plant on a very small remote island, but the one to two megawatt can serve a community very, very well. And we can do that. We have the ability to do that. I was also uh, recently, because I came from Mexico, as Ken quite rightly said, I just want to have one, uh, one, uh, one mention here uh, um, in terms of direct use applications. I came from Mexico. There was a Mexican Geothermal Association Congress. They invited me to speak as well. And in, in the form of direct use, these guys are amazing. They have developed uh, under their program a direct use, um, uh, let's say, program on heat pumps and, and heat exchangers, but also they make beer. And beer is, of course, something that we can all relate to in the sense that whether you like beer or not, but we understand that beer serves a purpose in terms of breweries and in terms of drinking and in terms of having fun. Um, but we have many breweries across the world that are more and more adopting uh, geothermal into their practices and uh, in terms of uh, sourcing not only the heat in order to drive the industrial processes, but also the CO2, because in order to make beer or gins and and the whiskies, because we also have some distilleries in our, in our, in our, let's say, in our customer portfolio. Uh, more and more people are interested in using, let's say, and utilizing the geothermal approach towards sustainable um, brewing processes. And Jackson, because you could not come, uh, Heber and uh, and uh, uh, Hector asked me to give you uh, oh, a token, a token of appreciation, a geothermal produced uh, beer, and hope to see you next time in uh, in in Mexico. With all that on direct use and the direct utilization, our current standpoint is around 110 gigawatt thermal. So we have over 30,000 applications worldwide, 110 gigawatt thermal is installed. The majority of that sits for space heating, bathing and swimming as said, and of course the greenhouse uh, heating. But we see in the coming decade, and we really hope of course to achieve that, sorry, I see you moving, I will work like this. Um, we really see that we can grow. We can grow substantially, of course, almost double uh, bathing, swimming, and space heating, especially space heating will probably see due to the current energy crisis even a further increase in terms of adoption of the technologies, both the shallow geothermal, the thermal networks, heat pumps, utilization of, let's say, the, 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 the aquifers, the shallow aquifers, but also the ability for geothermal to deliver on storage opportunities in combination with other renewable technologies. I think this is a very conservative outlook made last year. I think with the current, let's say, situation we are faced with worldwide, that energy security and being more aware of em our emissions and global standards that want to reduce that, is uh, probably going to see an enormous demand for heat. And I think this is part of the seven years that are now part of the geothermal that I see has changed significantly. I think we pushed a lot with geothermal over the past decade. I think this will be the decade of demand for geothermal. And as soon as there is demand for geothermal, we as clever, smart people who have all the solutions in stock can help to deliver on that demand. And I think this is the wind of change that I feel. And I hope you are with me by accelerating that because that we are still not as strong and not as abundant as could be is of course um, uh, for me an, uh, an obvious uh, statement to make. Uh, electricity, because I do think this is an important topic to, uh, although we have 16 gigawatts uh, electric uh, installed, this is an important topic. The world will be electrified. Uh, there is no denying of that uh, uh, as a strong and uh, sure statement. We will go into electrification and hence us serving electricity to uh, either grids, remote uh, islands or remote communities who are not necessarily uh, 
within a grid is, of course, for us a very important value proposition across the world. Lardarello, Italy, the first geothermal power plant was constructed here in Tuscany, close to Pisa in, uh, in Italy. It runs for over 120 years almost. It is a fantastic achievement. It's Enel Green Power, and they're still nurturing it in terms of they just have some small operational expenditure uh, to keep it going. But basically, it has been providing free energy towards the region for over 50 or 60 years because it was paid off already in the 1950s. Can you imagine 70 years of free energy? Who doesn't want that in their backyard? Well, apparently Italians don't want it because as we discussed this morning as well, they have now some difficulties trying to convince locals, trying to convince communities and trying to convince even national government to constantly keep on um, uh, advocating, but also lobbying and providing the right incentives for further developments. Isn't that an odd world? You basically have free energy, something that comes from beneath your own land. You don't have to import and still people struggle with the concept of geothermal. On the other hand, Icelanders have really coined geothermal as part of their uh, as, as part of their uh, energy mix. Uh, basically, there are two sources in Iceland: it's hydropower and it's geothermal. This Heidi is one of the biggest uh, power plants. Uh, it's, it's actually a combination between power and heat, so it is a combined heat and power plant. They're doing electricity and they're serving Reykjavik with uh, with heat. Basically. The way to cool down Reykjavik is open the window, which is also a source of free energy, obviously, but this is how abundant geothermal is. And of course, they're blessed with a beautiful island that has all these resources. But I think, and I would say that we can do this almost everywhere if we have the right technology mindset and of course also adaptation uh, towards this. Hedlis Heidi is the one who is putting electrolyzers in a part of their uh, power plant. They're sourcing now green hydrogen to power up uh, or fuel, I should say, their cars. So they have a few pilots here uh, in, uh, in and around Hedlis Heidi in order to test, to demonstrate and to utilize hydrogen because that the world is moving to one way or other and hydrogen economy is also a given. Whether we like it or not, the buzzword is around hydrogen. And one of my favorite countries to visit is Kenya. I must say it is not only a very beautiful country and it is a magnificent country, but again, in terms of untapped potential, I think this is the world word for geothermal sometimes. We have loads of untapped potential. In Kenya, the steam fields are just, you know, you see them, you see them right beneath your feet. You see them in the front of your eyes. And hence, uh, it is always a bit difficult to understand why only let's say a percentage of that uh, potential is being tapped into. On the other hand, if you look at Kenya's energy mix, 40% of their electricity and clean electricity is coming from geothermal. So in that sense, they have reached a certain, let's say development that is serving a purpose for the Kenyan population. What I like about the Kenyan story, and I think this is also part of the IGA and why I think we are uh, needed as global partner to constantly tell these stories. What I like about Kenya, not only did they develop their own journey, they are now helping neighbors as well in terms of developing geothermal, in terms of capacity building. They are uh, advising, let's say, governments in the form of best practices in terms of legal framework, how you set up regulations. That is not easy. It is also clear. It's not easy to start a country up from scratch. But if you now look at where Kenya is heading towards Djibouti, Tanzania, Rwanda, and even further south, uh, uh, they're working along with colleagues from Zambia, Botswana, and even all the way to South Africa. So. I think capacity building, education, and having skilled labor is crucial in, or in terms of supplementing and supporting our growth area, because ultimately we need people. We need people who know how to assess uh, the resource in terms of evaluation. We, know we need, need people who can drill the resource, who can produce the resource. We need to build power plants and heating infrastructure. We need going, we're going to need a lot of people as well that all needs to be skilled. One way or the other, we need to build capacity across the globe. Our geothermal power growth. Um, currently, we are at 16 gigawatts electric. It's now 2023. We are almost halfway this decade. And I am very conservative, of course, with my saying here, because it's 23. We still have two years ago before we are really at the half of our decade. 
But we have a couple of years to go before we had, let's say, uh, an end of the decade uh, summary. And at the moment, we're progress for, we're projected, we're forecasted to reach around 25 gigawatts electric. 25 gigawatt electric, this is what is in the pipeline. Uh, I come to the acceleration in a sec, but this is what we currently have in the pipeline by assessing and by, let's say, mapping and by getting an, an adequate uh, look and feel on the ground in terms of the countries who have made commitments towards geothermal. Leading country at this moment who have put skin in the game, not only from the government, but also from the technology suppliers, and hence the rollout is Indonesia. They are very, very keen to develop a further three to four gigawatt electric in the coming decades. And I think we should all say yes to that in terms of helping Indonesia to develop. I saw the exciting news, uh, news that uh, Chevron is uh, taking a position again in Indonesia. Pertamina is on the rise, it's the national player. Um, but still, it is, uh, it, is, it is a country with tremendous potential. And you could also argue why only adding three. The potential in Indonesia is about 30 to 40 gigawatts. Why only adding three? Why only adding three? And hence, these are, these are conservative, let's say, projections. These are conservative estimates. This is what people have said, what they have dictated, what they have put forward in their NDCs, their national development contribution towards, let's say, mitigating climate change and reducing CO2 emissions. The US, you have promised to deliver 1.2 gigawatts. And of course, this is a conservative estimate because if all the new technology that is being deployed, hopefully commercially by the end of this decade, maybe this number is completely wrong. I don't, uh, I don't take uh, my uh, take uh, on this for, uh, for the truth, but this is what we currently know about the plants that are in the pipeline in terms of adding uh, towards uh, electricity. Philippines, Turkey, Kenya, Mexico, those are the countries who have committed and have plans in the pipeline. Uh, and uh, as you can see, certain others uh, have a long way to go, such as Ethiopia, who not uh, even have, uh, let's say, launched the first electron on the grid, even after negotiating a PPA for 14 years. One point I want to make is uh, the top sides in the sense of uh, what we see happening in the supply chain when it comes down to those power plants. Traditionally speaking, geothermal comes from hot areas, high entropy, and hence flash turbines were the ones that were sold most. At the moment, what we see actually is over the past, let's say, uh, six, seven years, we see actually a huge shift towards binary, a huge shift. So the most sold turbines these days are the binary cycle and all these flash type of uh, technologies that require very hot temperatures are actually on the decline for geothermal. Let's say, yeah, be honest, this is for geothermal. And the story that you can interpret from that is that there is a need for lower entropy resources to be uh, developed. And that is partly the shift towards, let's say, sedimentary basin. So as geologists, we can finally go back to our sandstones and our carbonates instead of all these difficult magmatic intrusions and, and volcanoes. But it does tell you that the world is looking differently in terms of exploring and producing geothermal because our turbines tell that story. Lower entropy, smaller, and uh, advancing, let's say, the story of geothermal in terms of uh, developing it in, in, in mid-entropy uh, resources. Um, our geothermal workforce at the moment, 196,000 people together across the world, 196,000 people is not so much. We are with uh, only 20% of them are females. I do always want to make this point because it is important. Part of the SDGs is of course providing diversity, inclusion and hence equality and equity is crucial if you want to build a society that is uh, worth uh, our while. Uh, and hence in geothermal, we have a task as well. 20% uh, is just not good enough. Uh, students, uh, I, I'm not sure how it is here at the UT, but most of the time there are loads of female students at that early stage uh, career. They study geology or petroleum engineering or any type of engineering. Uh, but as soon as they go into work, it's sort of, uh, well, it goes down from 50-50 to maybe a 40-60 percentage. And for some reason, they disappear uh, <laughs> higher up in the, in the ranks. Uh, that we see this everywhere is a trend. It's not a specific country who does better than other. This is 20% females versus 80% uh, uh, men. And we have an organization called Women in Geothermal. I, uh, uh, it's open for men and women, uh, of course, uh, to join. 
Uh, and uh, this is an organization working also very closely with us as IGA because we monitor these things as well and we talk to, 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 to the governments and relevant players in order to constantly put the mirror up there. This is important and I also think very valuable around my discussions with the World Bank where more and more money is only put to projects that provide but also guarantee that there is a diversity angle, an equity angle and an inclusion angle. This is going to be crucial for green financing as well, I am convinced of that. To take a step back, because sometimes I live in my geothermal bubble, and uh, I think you uh, agree to that, that uh, we believe in it, you believe in it, uh, we all believe in geothermal, whether we come from technology, geoscience, or from a supply chain uh, management point of view, we see more geothermal happening. But the other partners I talk with, the other partners that have no knowledge of geothermal, but are just administrating and looking after policies and let's say setting some goals for clean energy targets, they have not heard of geothermal and why is that? Because we only contribute 0.5% towards the entire electricity mix. To be fair, this is the entire renewable energy mix. And as I said, 80% of electricity is generated by fossil fuels. So within that pie of 20%, we generate 0.5%, which is minute, which means as a dwarf, which makes us almost invisible at the negotiation table. So if there's one thing that we need to do in terms of accelerate and scale, is that at least we become more prominent in our discussions with the leaders of the world, the decision makers, et cetera. Wind is of course predominantly on the rise, but actually hydropower is the one that provides most of the baseload clean electricity and it has done so for over uh, decades. It is one of the oldest renewable technologies and many countries have large dams uh, in their in their in their jurisdictions and in their countries, uh, solar is on the rise. Wind is on the rise. Those are the two obvious renewable technologies that will see some uh, increase in the percentage. But I think as geothermal, we can do so much better, and we need to do so much better because we have no lever anymore otherwise to discuss and negotiate. And I thought in heat we must do better in heat, but. Not so much. So in heat, let's take a look. These are data coming from our friends at IRENA and with the IEA and with REN21. We work every year very hard to produce the right amount of data. Definitions become a problem sometimes because what is heat and who sources heat and who owns heat? And I bet these are the questions you have here in Texas as well. But if you look at where our renewable consumption uh, for, uh, let's say, for clean heat uh, sits, it's again around 20-30% uh, of clean heat is being generated uh, because the rest is, of course, again, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and there you see that uh, we have a significant part coming from bioenergy, biomass in general, but also bioenergy and uh, some solar thermal, some renewable electricity. Uh, waste heat is of course a very important one uh, for those uh, who consider waste heat as renewable because let's be honest, it's all about definitions in the end. And we're serving 0.3%. 0.3% is served by geotherm. And that it makes us again, the smallest technologies to play with. Um, happy? Uh, no, but that is realistic. Yes. And again, uh, we need to grow the pie. We need to grow, of course, in terms of sourcing renewable heat, but also as geothermal, we need to ensure that we are at the right conversations at the right time to produce the numbers we actually need. Um, I wasn't very happy with the IEA. I love the IEA, but uh, when you constantly read in the energy outlooks that we are not on track, is not a very nice statement uh, to, to read. Uh, and and I, I do appreciate that we all live in the bubble. We all live in a geothermal dream. I, I am convinced, we are all convinced, but ultimately if leading organizations who are advising the leading governments of this world that geothermal is not on track, is not good for our image, it's not good for our reputation, and it constantly gives you the feeling that you're trying to run up the hill. And I think it's time that we slide down. So I think it's time to accelerate, uh, and I'm very happy with all the initiatives that come from Texas. So I really uh, salute you. I really commend you, the hard work you've put into this for producing reports, advocating, getting people together, the startups, the technology, uh, the, the, the conversations you are having here, I think can act uh, one day, hopefully as a blueprint, not only for other states, but also for the world. There is, a, there is so much potential. I think we agree on that, but we need to unlock that potential. And the discussion between what is geothermal and the, the, the type of technologies, that is not up to me to have a conversation on because I, I love it all. 
We need geothermal to be there at the table. We need to be, let's say, active in all the regions where there is a demand for clean heat and clean electricity. We all have a duty to, to develop that in case you are working in geothermal. So with acceleration, and especially the plans that I've been reading so far coming from, let's say, some very bold statements sometimes coming from the state of Texas, uh, which I think is fantastic because you need to be ambitious. Uh, we hope uh, that we can maybe even develop by the end of this decade from these promising startups further gigawatts. So please do your best. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's add some extra gigawatts to the grid, not only here in Texas, of course in Texas, but also within the US because uh, you have California, you have uh, Nevada, they're doing amazing things, but you have 51 states, can 51 states that can all have a geothermal. So uh, I think there is work to do in the in the US. But besides that, there is also work to do in the European Union. There is work to do in Asia Pacific. There's work to do in Africa, Middle East, and of course Latin America as a continent that is on the rise. There's two centers where you see population grow and where you will see demand for, and that is Asia Pacific at one end, and that is Latin America at the other end. And those are exactly the countries where I think all the technologies of the world can come together and help develop geothermal. So in short, let's, uh, let's, let's put some new ones to this and also uh, act a little bit uh, optimistic. And I know I am very conservative probably for certain uh, ambitious uh, plans that we will see in, uh, in Texas and beyond. But uh, by the end of this decade, 2030, when we are, uh, let's say seven years from now, 40 gigawatt electric and 220 gigawatt thermal, that would be a fantastic result if we are as a global community able to deliver on that. Part of our acceleration program, and it fits very nicely, I think, with all the ambitions that I've been reading in other parts of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, yeah, of not only your work, but also parts of the globe. We have four points, four points in our acceleration program, and one of them uh, fits very nicely with what you're doing here. Off-grid solutions. There are millions of islands, and there are several energy communities waiting for clean energy solutions across the globe. We don't need always to go big. We can go small. So small modular binaries, ORC type of uh, uh, power plants delivering a couple of megawatts or even below a megawatt is going to be future uh, uh, for geothermal. Green hydrogen is going to be crucial. I'll come to those points in a sec. Geothermal direct use talked about that and the hot rocks innovation. So for the off-grid solutions, we have a couple of, let's say, messages that we would like to give out. Uh, and I know you are here, maybe not an off-grid uh, solution target, but with your new technology, you can. Meaning that these communities that are living on the diesel-powered uh, islands, uh, Caribbean, the uh, Fiji islands in the Pacific, uh, I recently had conversations with Mauritius and Rodriguez, which is the far east of the African continent. These are all islands who really are keen to develop sustainable energy solutions, and we can deliver on that via geothermal. The future is hydrogen. Okay, The future is hydrogen, whether we like it or not. That's the bandwagon. And I say, let's jump on it, because uh, if there's one thing that I think will hold back geothermal, is that we're not part of a global conversation. And hence, if we are part of a global conversation by generating hydrogen that can serve as a commodity that can be traded between countries where ports will serve the maritime sector that will all going to be run and fueled by hydrogen and we are part of that conversation, it is going to be crucial, not only for our image, but also of our technology suppliers because all these electrolyzers they, well, at the moment, the IEA says they're going to be built in offshore wind farms, but I say let's build them in geothermal power plants because closer to the ports and uh, probably a little bit more affordable with our steam and high temperature. Um, we've launched a very small uh, impact fund. Uh, geothermal direct use is not easy, uh, but it has uh, uh, enormous potential when it comes down to serving not only communities again, but also food markets and and hence that supply chain around the discussions on food and, and, and wellness and, 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 and all these, uh, let's say, smaller type of projects that, uh, that are utilizing directly the heat uh, that is uh, beneath. Uh, but for that, uh, project finance is needed. It's not easy sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's easier to launch a big project and have multiple million of dollars. But if you need a half a million or maybe even a piece of pipe in a power plant uh, that uh, a national player can't afford, it's difficult to find and sometimes small tickets. And hence the IGA has launched an initiative around uh, supplying some, some knowledge, uh, technical uh, roadmaps, technical guidelines, and 
setting up these centers of excellence with especially the national operators uh, of many of the global south uh, countries uh, who are in need of finance, but also are in need of training, capacity building and education. And we're very happy with uh, all the new things that are buzzing, because let's be honest, the IGA has come from a very traditional world of geothermal uh, with the leading countries uh, that have tapped into geothermal already uh, a long time ago. But I think the playing field is wider, is bigger, and also we need to push harder. And uh, I'm very happy with all the international collaboration that I see so far. The advocacy is here. Uh, the Clean Air Task Force project in a space that we talked about. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for being a trailblazer. But also all the R&D and the new, let's say, uh, ways of looking at geothermal, whether it's about data, about sharing, about making, um, let's say, an open source access towards data, and hence providing a hub for education. Because if there's one thing that is holding back geothermal, at least from my perspective, is that people just don't know. People just don't know what geothermal actually is and what it can do to their country, their region, their community, their city, their house even. And hence, if an average citizen of this planet doesn't know, then an average politician doesn't know either. And hence the need to educate always over and over again is so crucial that I can't, uh, let's say, refrain from not talking uh, about it. So uh, a couple of words on the new technology, because I do think that this is going to be exciting. On the left-hand side is, of course, where we come from traditionally. We see a shift towards EGS, and we see a shift towards more, let's say, hot, dry rock. It has been tried many times. Uh, there are only a few countries who have uh, some projects around EGS, but I think it's on the rise. That is important. Uh, I do say from a European point of view, but also from certain, uh, let's say, incidences that we've had, First of all, let's not mention the F word. It's, uh, it is uh, crucial, uh, but also let's regulate this really well. And a seismic incident uh, that uh, has blocked uh, certain projects uh, in the European Union uh, is causing so much, uh, let's say, adversity and animosity is not helping the dialogue. So do this really well. And I think we have a winner. But I also think uh, we should do this uh, with some um, with some soft skills as well to educate our regulators, but also educate the public on EGS. I'm very excited about all the closed leap uh, developments. You know much more about that than I will ever do, but I'm very excited. I see some amazing things happening in Germany. I, I was so happy and also a little bit surprised because this is amazing that the EEC, so the Climate Fund under the European Commission funded ever with 91 million uh, seed money, which is incredible. It's just incredible. It shows that we are winning. We are winning when it comes down to geothermal, when we're able to unlock these finances. I think here in the US, you're doing even much better uh, with the amounts of millions that you are able to unlock around the new technology. I think it's the future, uh, but again, it needs to be commercialized. Obviously, it will take time. So hopefully by the end of the decade, you will add all the gigawatts. And what I see also is happening is uh, around supercritical and uh, real deep geothermal. That's exciting as well, of course. So let's see where it will take us uh, on the journey towards building more geothermal, more geothermal projects. With that, I already said, as IGA, we are worldwide. We're acting in many countries. We have, uh, let's say, we come from education, capacity building and advising on the best practices. We come from standardization. We have built in, let's say, resource management, uh, sustainability standards. We're advising governments and we're advising the financial sector, predominantly coming from the public side. Uh, our activities let's say, are done in a way when the country is able to uh, or has been proven uh, geothermal uh, resources to be implemented uh, in their energy mix, which is why you see the IGA more and more active in what we call these days the global south. It's the emerging countries, it's the countries where there is either a need for education and capacity building, but also a need for small scale finance, which is what we have adopted now with our new foundation, uh, unlocking finance for, for the green goals, so to speak. And hence for us, it's very important to, uh, yeah, to work together, to internationally cooperate and to make everything happen under the geothermal umbrella, both the big, big investments, both the, let's say the new technology that needs to be deployed, but also the people who just want to earn a living and sell a product based on clean heat. So thank you for that. Thank you for having me here. And with that, uh, let's make not only the goal of 260 gigawatt energy by the end of this decade happen, but also increasing our workforce and by creating the right skill sets and by making sure that we provide energy to all in a clean and affordable way. Thank you.
Thank you, Merritt. Uh, I'll point out your for North America, where there what one of your dots? Geothermal Rising is your yes. affiliate partner yes, here, for sure. right? Yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah, long standing. Yes. 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 Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, let's start back here. Thank you. It's a very interesting um, presentation. So my question is like for your geothermal, if you're comparing with other renewable technologies, right? What is really your cost hurdles? Like what is the things that, uh, I mean, most of the solar and wind, for example, in the US right now is heavily subsidized still for either tax credits and other things. So given that, right? What are the things that probably cost hurdles for geothermal. Yeah, so this is this is a, the, the 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 very good question and not only the number one to 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 answer I guess uh, when it comes down for investors but also for from the public side of of money. So what you see traditionally in geothermal we have this valley of death which means that we have high upfront costs because not only do we need to test and evaluate our resources because of course a smart geologist can say there's so much gigawatt uh, underground but you have to test you have to evaluate do the feasibility studies and do a test well, which may or may not be the one you need in order to produce the clean energy from, which is very similar to oil and gas, but the bonus, the price, the bonanza is not there within geothermal because it's still water or steam or something we call heat that we bring at surface. So high upfront cost with some risk involved. And hence, typically what you see investors shy away from is taking that, let's say, that risk, that, that risk approach. So governments who have, let's say, nailed this, um, uh, and let's say World Bank with its risk mitigation strategies have been able to develop certain loans and grants and guarantees in order to make this happen. But still, overall and all, you see that we still operate between seven and 10 cents the kilowatt hour in terms of electricity provision. And these days, especially with a huge fall down of solar and wind, whether we like the LCO method or not, I mean, that's another discussion that we would be happy to have, but Currently, everyone, let's say, compares by the LCOE, the left less cost of electricity method. And there you see solar and winds being less risky, being very, relatively speaking, easy to implement, and only, say, three, five cents the kilowatt hour. So we are high risk, high upfront cost. No one actually knows if it's going to work. Um, and we're even higher in the price. And that has caused, let's say, say, this value of death that only certain countries, governments, or private entities have been daring to take on. And if we can nail that, if we can bridge that valley of death, I think we are in business. Now, part of that is gonna come through, I hope at least the new technologies, but part of it is also operators who just push, push, push for more projects because that we know how to do geothermal is to me uh, given. We know how to do geothermal, but to, be, to make bigger projects or more projects will help of course to scale down on the cost. Well, there is a question behind. Oh, oh. behind you. So I would. So I'm first of all, I share your enthusiasm overall, but very dampened enthusiasm watching this whole field for um, thirty years at least, right? Yeah. So um, and being where it is now, right? Yeah. Um, other areas are growing, and geothermal, not so much. So I think there are substantial technology issues to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, and technology in then nature, looking at your map, two thirds are blue and not red, right? So uh, the energy is in part where we don't need it or vice versa. I mean, Iceland, right? Yeah, we can do things with geothermal in Iceland, but not too many people living there, right? So how do we get geothermal to the Eastern US or the Central US, right? Um, and then EGS, let's be honest, it's been a disaster for decades now, right? there's still huge challenges to overcome and DOE is throwing a lot of money at it and hopefully there will be a breakthrough. But the issue there is fractures want to go straight, single fractures, and that's not conducive to producing heat. We want distributed fraction networks. That's a challenge that has to be overcome. Um, we looked into low enthalpy, what we call um, oil field geothermal. Oh, great. Um, uh, yeah, nice. And then the operators tell us, well, it's so much cheaper just to plug into the grid. Um, looked, well, you may have to tap into some other waste heat sources to make it viable. But even if you can make it in a few places, how do you scale this up? Yeah. So 
a lot of small technical issues to be solved. Yeah. Many of them, some are geologic, some are engineering, some are purely economic. I don't know. But um, so I'm not sure if it can really share you into for power generation, right? Yeah, for for, I, for I, I, I direct heating, you. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Use this, the heat. But for power generation, yeah. um, I think we have to be realistic and really identify what are the lowest hurdle technology barriers where we can make progress and maybe then realize that, you know, closed loop, I don't know, you know, I mean, there's some serious issues with that, right? And, and focus on the ones that are easier to address. I don't know. What's your take on it? Well, <laughs> it's supposed to be a question, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, no, but this is also the conversation I think is very fruitful to have anyway, because as you say, I mean, uh, yes, I am enthusiastic. I think we are all very enthusiastic when it comes down to geothermal, but there is also realism. And the realism says that we have been flatlining, especially in power. And hence, that's technology uh, for sure. I agree with that. It's site-specific because it has been developed in site-specific conditions. But overall, what I, and I say this, of course, on behalf of my role as IGA, but what I see is changing is that governments are changing in the sense that policies are changing. Policies become much more benign and more, let's say, uh, uh, looking after sustainability and clean energy. And hence, I think what is different from 30 years ago is that we had fossil fuels dominating the energy sector, which is for, what, for the right reason at that time. But I think now it's 2023, not only will government be faced with some significant, let's say climate change issues, but also we have, climate change we have the climate accord we have we have we have mandates that are coming with with cleaning up you know our air and why that is important and why i believe that is going to be a new decade for geothermal is because governments will push they will push they will incentivize they will subsidize making it much more um let's say easier for a lot of companies to come together and develop geothermal because i think the thing in the past and why is Iceland good at it and why New Zealand is good at it and why Italy was good in it? Because the government allowed them to develop. And I think many countries, let's say between the 60s, 70s, with the height maybe in geothermal in the 80s, have since then refrained from developing the correct policies for geothermal because they had abundance of coal, abundance of oil, abundance of gas. Because let's be honest, the biggest competitor for geothermal is gas not only for electricity, but also for heating and, 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 and cooling. And hence, for whatever it's worth, but we have a crisis in the world. It's an energy security crisis. It's an energy independence crisis. There is a war going on with some super majors that are, that are fighting. And on top of that, we have this layer called climate change. And that is allowing, I think, more governments to substantially invest and to look at tax credits that has been, let's say, developed very nicely for solar and wind. But I think it's now the time for geothermal to be incentivized. And with that, as when you incentivize and when policies will be there and the ambassadors of the world, uh, like, uh, like your secretary, uh, Jennifer Granholm uh, says, uh, obsessed with geothermal, or I love geothermal, or whatever she said at Zero Week, this is crucial. And this is different than three decades ago. And yes, I'm enthusiastic about that. And the technology, let's have a discussion. I think that becomes a very inter interesting conversation. Um, but I think uh, we need all the technologies that we can have. Uh, and some are proven, some are, some are already, of course, existing. Some needs to be proven. But I think what I see going on is that they will be, uh, at least they will be tested. And I think then we can have a very nice conversation on how much they will deliver on, on energy. But thank you for that. And I think it's a real, real good comment. So, yeah. Okay, that's a good spot to close. We're out of time for the official presentation, but please stick around for uh, follow-up questions. Thank you very much, Merit. Thank you. Thank you.